evening to you. Pastor Joe here. Really excited that you're able to join us on this segment of Embracing the Moment. This is a, a segment where we continue to dialogue and prayerfully discuss how can we worship as we wait for this pandemic to pass through. And then really this is also an opportunity for us to be able to, to see what's happening in our culture at large and see how God is leading his church to respond. So we're looking to bridge that gap in conversations that we're having with all sorts of different guests. And so today on, on Embracing the Moment, I'm excited to have a conversation with my friend and my colleague, Pastor Bob Tome. He's our interim lead pastor here at Genesis Church. And then we're really excited to interview our good friend and colleague, Pastor Reggie Hunter. Uh, he's over at Recovery House of Worship, and he also, uh, Recovery House of Worship also have a, has a partnership with Genesis Church. So without further ado, I want to kick things over to you, Pastor Reggie. Can you share a little bit about who you are, uh, what your role is with Our How, and a little bit more about what our relationship is uh, as Genesis Church and Our How have partnered together here? Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, and welcome to those that are viewing. I'm excited about being here to be able to talk about what addiction looks like during this time of pandemic in York, Pennsylvania, as well as across the world, not just the United States, but across the world. Um, I, I think right at this juncture, I want to qualify. So some folks might think, well, what does he know about addiction and how to recover from addiction? What does he know about it? Well, after 25 years in the streets of Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., New Jersey, Pittsburgh, using drugs in all of those places and being incarcerated in most of those places, I kind of know a little bit about the addiction and what addiction can and will take you through. I've been through swine flu epidemic, epidemic. I've been through some of the other epidemics. I've been through the gas shortages. I've been through economic crash. I've been through the AIDS virus uh, pandemic and epidemic. So all of those times were not reasons for me to, to stop doing drugs. All of those times I found ways, means, and reasons to use drugs. In this pandemic that we're going through now, there are people who are just like me, who drugs have become the answer to the questions that life poses for them. What are you saying? I'm glad you asked. What I'm saying is that drugs become a way out of the horrors of, a, of, of, the, of the regular life sentences that we have, like children, jobs, wives, husbands. It comes as an answer to my financial woes, and it comes as an answer to a lot of the things that I would fall on that I can't fall on now because I'm locked in the house. I can't go to a movie. I can't have uh, retail therapy. I can't have uh, 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 all the other things that I'm used to having as ways out of my addiction, now I'm stuck in the house. So addiction becomes a battle with it. I begin to have to fight against the very thing that I'm trying to fight to stay away from. It becomes more evident that that might end up being my friend again. So I, I, I want to kind of convey today that some people are struggling from so many different types of, of anxiety, depression, grief, hopelessness, the dilemmas of to be or not to be, to do the right thing, not to do the right thing, to shop when I know I don't have the money, to worry, to get frustrated, to stop praying, to stop looking at the, the word of God, to stop doing the very things that got us to this point of freedom in recovery. So I want to kind of talk about those things as well as talk about some of the solutions that we found as well as how to deal and how to cope in this time that we're going through right now. Ooh, amen and amen, man. You got me fired up. I'm excited. I'm excited. We're so glad to have you on here, Pastor Reggie. Thanks for, thanks for that awesome introduction there. And Pastor Bob, I want to make sure uh, I, I give you a, a shout out here as well. Uh, any, anything you'd like to add there as, as we begin our conversation, Pastor Bob? Uh, the only thing I would reinforce uh, with what Pastor Reggie said is that regardless of what situations are going on in life, that does not stop the struggle that people have. And we want to make sure that in their struggle, we offer hope even during this time. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, Pastor Reggie, can, can you kind of, going off of what you, what you opened up with there, can, can you start to begin to walk us through in this dialogue, how can those who are in recovery, specifically those in recovery, how can they help protect themselves during this pandemic so that they don't fall back into relapse? They, there are some things that we begin to do. And uh, one, of course, is identifying that you've got a problem. 
Uh, I, I've been speaking with several individuals and they've been talking about the depression, they've been talking about the anxiety, they've been talking about how to deal with the claustrophobic uh, uh, process that's going on with them, the walls are starting to shrink in, how they feel away from people, not having the touch, not having those things. So what we've decided to do was we're starting to have, thank God for te technology. We're having Zoom meetings, we're having Facebook chat meetings, we're offering people prayer, we're offering people uh, private meetings on Zoom so that we can deal with their issues and their family issues. And I think one of the biggest things that we've been able to encourage people is to not to try to handle this on your own. Um, left up to our own devices, we always go back to the very thing that's comfortable, even though that thing that we go back to might not be good. Um, one of the things that we're finding in this pandemic right now, that people are going back to the, the depression, going back to the anxiety, going back to the pornography, going back to gambling, because you know you don't have to physically go out and gamble anymore. Thanks to technology, they're gambling on the phone. You don't have to go out anymore. They're delivering food to your house. They're delivering groceries to your house. They're delivering uh, pizza. They're delivering uh, items that you can buy off the internet to your house. So everything that could have been a vice prior to this happening is now still available if you don't do some things. We're strategically helping people develop prayer life. We're just strategically helping people identify with, with the cause and effect. Here's one of the things we always ask. If sex is your answer, what's your problem? If gambling is your answer, what's your problem? If drugs are your answer, what's your problem? Because there has to be another question. It can't be that you just have an answer with no question. If we can get you to get to your question, we can get you to get a new answer. So, so we, we kind of developed that approach so that we're dealing with somebody. As a matter of fact, this morning, somebody was talking to me about being hopeless and how hopelessness has the ability to wrap itself around us mm -hmm. and take its, its, its claws and stick its claws into us and make addiction or whatever that is become alive and well again because it gives us instant gratification. It gives us temporary relief. It gives us the ability to forget about our reality momentarily. But what it does is it compounds our problem, which causes us to want more. And then once the, 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 the endorphins and the dopamine gets to moving in your head, more and more and more is gonna is, is just not going to be enough. And we always end up back in those places that we worked so hard to get away from. Mm. That's, that's powerful. I love that, that image that, that you talked about with this, this idea, right? I mean, it's a, it's a double-edged sword because it's a blessing that we have the ability to have things literally delivered right to our doorsteps and right at our fingertips on our smartphones. And yet how that can really cause some struggle for people, right? So we can, we can even broaden this conversation. You know, we're, we're starting kind of more narrow in this conversation. How can those who are in recovery, not go back into relapse during this time. But here's the reality, right? Is that all of us, and, and we're, we're having a dialogue as three pastors, right? Even, even the three of us, we struggle with the old nature. We struggle with, with sins and, and struggles and addictions of our own. They might not be substance abuse addictions, but look, hey, you're looking at someone who my whole life, I mean, as far back as I can remember, struggling with fear. And what, you know, what, what a season like this can do to somebody who struggles with fear and so I just, I just really, I appreciate that, Pastor Reggie. I appreciate what, what you're sharing and how you specifically are working with people to give them practical discipleship steps and, and ways that they can not just survive this time, right? And I mean, it's an, it's an old cliche, not just survive, but thrive. But that's the reality of the life that we have in Christ and the freedom that he's given us. So I just, I'm really grateful for, for folks like yourself who are on the front lines, on the spiritual end of things, helping those who are in recovery recover well and actually thrive in the middle of, of this pandemic for us. Pa Pastor Bob, is there, is there anything that, that you'd like to add a, as well to what Pastor Reggie is saying? This is, this is a good, good beginning to our conversation. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I would ask Pastor Reggie, as, as you uh, think about people and making decisions, do you find that the people living in the house with them are a help? or are they sometimes more of a hindrance in their continued recovery process? Excellent, excellent question. I just got off the phone with a treatment facility who's trying to develop ways of understanding the impact of family towards helping somebody stay or that will enable them not to stay clean. 
I talked to a brother this morning and his brother-in-law is using heroin and his brother-in-law has an inability to be honest with his wife and she found him unconscious the other day from an overdose and she called and said she needed help and before the help got there he came out of it and he used is example of being on the floor that it was some bad weed. But unfortunately, the family members usually don't know the symptoms and signs of addiction, not just drug addiction. They don't know the symptoms and the signs of addiction. So I think our job as clergy, as ministry, Pastor Bob, we have to start doing three things. We have to educate, we have to encourage, and we have to empower. And when we do that, we educate them on what the symptoms look like. We educate them as to what they can do for themselves. We educate them on how to be courageous in their conversations. We educate them on how to develop protocol that the persons must follow in their house. We educate them on what to look for, what not to allow, how not to enable, and how to make a person accountable by becoming an accountability partner so that the person now not only can can look at you for assistance in helping them get better, but look at you as a role model that they can use to get better. I find that most of us who have problems in our family, we look past it because of the love that we have for them and we make excuses for them. And oftentimes that causes them to spiral more so into the addiction than what it does to help them. We need to have education, number one. Number two, we need to encourage, listen, we need to know the language biblically to help them be encouraged. We need to also know that if we encourage them, we don't have to enable them. And then once we do that, we empower them to be able to walk out what they've decided to do for themselves. And being a certified recovery specialist, one of the things we learn is how to help a person develop a program for themselves and how to hold them accountable based on what they wrote down and what they've agreed to do. And then when they do that, that begins to empower them to be able to walk out. How we do that? Short goals. We need a one-week goal. We need a three-week goal. We need a six-month goal, and we need a year goal. And in your year goal, I want you to establish something that you don't think you can attain. Because once we get to the first two goals, it gives you momentum to want to establish the goal in long term. And the family has to be a part of that, not enable that. And we thank God for Genesis Church in, in, in the counseling piece. Once we find out that a person has an enabler and or a wife and or a son and or a daughter that has addiction or is the, the person that's struggling with the other person's addiction, then they may need counseling. So we send them to places like Genesis Church to get the counseling that they need. We send them to, to, to places that they can get therapy. We send them to places that professional, you know what I mean, um, at, at other treatment facilities so that they, they can get what they need to get themselves okay, so then that way they can help their family member become better. Mm. Yes, you know, I think about, uh, I remember one time talking to a dad, and as you're talking, I think about uh, parents or family members who, who don't learn themselves to look for the signs. I remember talking to a dad one time who really believed his son was using substance, uh, uh, marijuana, and things like that, and he said, but I can't find it anywhere. I said, well, when you go into his room, take the vents off the heater. And, you know, he did, and that's where he found stuff. I, I think sometimes we have a tendency, because we're family, we want to believe that our family member is okay because they're telling us they're okay. But I also know that what I hear from people in recovery is that there are two things that people who are addicted know what to do. They know how to lie, and they know how to steal. That's right. And, and one of the other things that we must never forget is they know how to manipulate. They also know how to cause a wedge in the family so that they can get what they want. They know how to have the proper anger and temper tantrums to get the attention that's necessary. And one of the other things is that they know how to play on the heartstrings of the mother or the heartstrings of the father mm -hmm. that will keep us being protective of their addiction, even though we may see signs and symptoms of their addiction, and, and we don't want to do anything about it because, like you said, most of us in church don't want to admit the fact that we got a problem in our family. But what I've learned is that there's nobody who's not either directly or indirectly affected by addictions of some kind. I don't know anybody that's not. Either directly or indirectly, it is in, in your first family structure, first part of your family structure, or in your family directly or indirectly, it's a direct effect. On two weeks ago, 
um, we found uh, that in Pennsylvania, York, Pennsylvania, that in January, there were eight overdoses in York in York County. In February, that number had doubled. It was 17 in York and York County. Strategically, addiction is going full force during this pandemic. In March, there were 24, which means that it had tripled by March to 24. By the seventh day of April, there were already nine. I've not gotten the numbers for April, of course, because April's not over. But that means at the rate that we're going, it may be three times that amount that we started with this month because people have chosen to be indoors. And these things that we talked about, Pastor Joe, earlier about the, the depression and the fear, people don't think that they're addicts. They don't think that they have a problem. But if fear is your answer, we got to get to the question. If anxiety is your question, we got to get we got to get to that place where we understand that it's more than just a drug. Addiction is not drugs. Addiction is not alcohol. Addiction is a disease that affects us mentally, physically, and spiritually. And it has the ability to take us away from everything of value that we ever valued in our life and force us to get pushed into a place where we begin to just act out on those behaviors. And we hide them for a while, and we hide them for a while. And like Pastor Bob said, look in the vents, look in the shoe boxes, look in the drawer, pull the drawer all the way out, look behind the drawer, lift the bed, roll the bed out, look at the, in the closet, and you start to find things that you never dreamed imaginable in some of the houses of the people that come to church on Sunday, praise the Lord, give their tithe, and then go back home on Sunday and go back to their reality. Mm, 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 mm. Gentlemen, what, as I, there are so many questions put in my mind. This is, this is such an important conversation and I want to be sensitive to what, what it is that, that the Lord might want to say through something like this. And so my, my next question is really a, a practical one. So what, what do we want to say? More importantly, what, what does the Lord want to say to people to provide hope? and provide healing. So we've been talking about those who are in recovery and then we've been broadening it. And pastor Reggie, you just went through that list again. And that is by no means an exhaustive list of challenges of struggles of addictions. So what is the, what is the practical way that we can have hope in, in, in the middle of this pandemic for all of us, because we all have our own particular struggles. You know, I have a, a three A's philosophy. First, I become aware. And then once I become aware of the problem, I need to become willing to admit that I have a problem. And then once I'm willing to admit that I have a problem, I have to accept that I need to do something about my problem. Those are the three A's that work for me in how we help people get from where they are to where they're going. And, and, and then we have to do biblical. We have to tell them that Matthew 11, 28 says that cast your cares on me for my burden is, my yoke is. We need people to understand that, that, that the word of God gives us some reinforcement as to what we need to do. Love your brother as you love yourself. We have to love people through what they're going through. We have to love them to where they're going. We always say in, in, in my house that I love you past where you're at. Because if I love you in the condition that you're in, I may be the very one that helps you stay in your condition. So I have to love you past where you're at. I have to love you past your fear. I have to love you past your anxiety. I have to love you past your anger. I have to love you past your hopelessness. These are all characteristics that are coming right now as a direct result of this pandemic. You, there, there's families right now, Pastor Joe, that sit in the house together that have become frustrated with each other and that now they need something to make them feel good about themselves. So now they're sneaking right now while we're on this podcast, going to the bathroom with the magazines, going to the phone, gambling on the phone, going to the bedroom, looking at things they got no business looking at, going to the basement, doing the drugs they, they, they know they shouldn't be doing because why is this kept? People are still selling drugs during this pandemic, and people are still buying. We just had somebody that overdosed on yesterday. So I know that it's still happening. I know that people are still dying. The numbers speak for themselves. And that's just the numbers from opioid. Even though there's a pandemic, there's still an epidemic that's going on. So, so I don't want to diminish the value of addiction in any way, but we need to be mindful that as pastors, we need to be looking at our congregation because the signs and the symptoms, even though we're on Zoom, 
we can still see signs and symptoms of what it looks like. We can listen. The Bible says, those that have an ear, let them hear. So we need to be able to hear what they're saying, even though they don't say it, because some things are not said. Mm -hmm. Some things we have to cipher through and get to, to, to the core of their problem in order to be able to help them. I know Pastor Bob can elaborate on that because he does that more in the counseling industry, having to hear what somebody's not saying. Yeah, I think also the um, uh, the need to let people know that, hey, we're there for you. You know, it's not an eight to five job when we think about caring for people and loving people. Uh, we're there for them. And I think that's the neat uh, partnership that we have because at Genesis, we can offer counseling, we can offer mentors, but uh, Pastor Reggie uh, from not only just experience, but the things that uh, you are involved in, you are able to help them even in a different way. And so both of our ways combined can really be a help for someone who's out there tonight and who's struggling. Amen. You know, one of the things I want to add real quickly is I'm, 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 I'm a recovering addict as well. And during this time, I've had to fight off the desires to want to do things like shop the desires to want to look at things I have no business looking at. I had to fight off the desires to want to be angry with my wife. I had to fight off the desires of not being certain about my financial situation right now with layoff, um, just getting laid off on Friday and not knowing what's going to happen as a direct result of the layoff. I had to fight to pray. I had to fight to read. I had to fight to study because everything in me, some, it just tells me, you don't, you see, here you are again. You don't deserve to be doing what you're doing. You ain't worthy of what you've been doing. God didn't mean for you to get to this place in your life. And all of those things that we have to battle against, it's a war that goes on inside of us that, that, that perpetuates itself. It continues to grow. It continues to manifest itself. It continues to call on the things that I've always had problems with. No self-esteem, inadequacies. It plays on that. And it makes me think that those things are better than what I'm going through. It makes me think that doing something other than the right thing is better. It makes me think that all I need is just a temporary relief from the very things I put years, 28 years to be exact, to get away from. Then we coming right back to the forefront. See, I told you it was going to end like this. See, you knew it was going to have nothing. See, you knew you wasn't good enough. See, it tells me those things and I have to fight those things. Watch this. To be able to encourage somebody else. Hmm. Amen. It's um, a daily struggle. Amen. I mean, we, we, we have touched on this at various points in this conversation. I was curious to hear especially for, from you on this, Pastor Reggie, from your vantage point, how has this, and we've touched on it, but how, how has this stay-at-home order affected those who, who are addicted to substances? I mean, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like it hasn't, it hasn't mitigated anything. In fact, it seems like the stay-at-home order, which uh, I'm not speaking about that negatively, okay? I'm not, I'm not that's, that's not what the purpose of this conversation is. In fact, I'm grateful that our officials are looking out for us to protect us. But at the same time, this conversation is very real because this stay at home order has not, ha has almost exacerbated these, these addictions and these struggles that, that we're talking about. And it sounds like that's, that's what you've seen and are seeing. I'm seeing an escalated use of drugs, alcohol, as well as sex, gambling. I'm seeing an escalated use of that, 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 that type of, thing going on now. And here's what I'm also noticing. I'm noticing that people in the health profession and the people who are first responders are now becoming people who are going to need us when this is all over. Because they may not have had a problem with drinking before, but because of what they're dealing with, they're starting to have an inability and a breakdown that they can't continue to handle the things. People are quitting. People are working as first responders that are getting the coronavirus virus and they're losing their momentum. There are people who are actually quitting their job because they can't handle the stresses of it anymore. There's people right now who have a problem with pills and opioids that didn't have it before that are working in the professional industry. It has started to take a new look. And it's, it's not going to be the ones that are just standing on the corner, the ones that we used to see. It's not going to be the ones that are going in and out of the institution. It's not going to be those. It's going to be the professionals, the doctors, the lawyers. The lawyer, just think about the lawyers. They're not working right now. Think about the judges. They're not working right now. Those people who have professions that depend on the criminal system are not working right now. They're locked in the house too. Can you imagine the stresses 
and the anxiety of somebody who paid the money that they paid to get the profession that they got a doctor 20 years of going to school to be sitting home now in this situation or a lawyer that went to school for 8, 10, 12, 14 years that's sitting home and can't do what he needs to do. There's, there's, there's a strategic thing that's happening now with us as pastors and we need to be doing just what we're doing here. Coming together, collaborating, seeing how we best can service the people because they're coming. They're coming. Professionals are coming. Small business owners are coming. Teachers are coming. Doctors are coming. School students are coming. They're coming. And we're going to have to be able to meet them where they are. And we're going to have to have a wraparound effect that will give us the ability to meet them where they are and help them get to where they're going. Mm. Beautiful. And, a, and quite a challenge. It's humbling. It's Awesome challenge. Like I shared with you, Pastor Joe, I hear your heart, man, and I understand um, the anxiety. I have, I, I have anxiety oftentimes. And my wife has is, is, is seen me walk back and forth, back and forth, from window to window, window to window, because I, 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 I'm not used to being confined. And, and, and it, it makes my mind start working in a way that my mind don't, it, it's not good for me. My mind starts working in those ways because I start thinking about ways to do things and ways that I can, 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 can get finances and ways that I can do other things. And my mind starts to tell me things that I know are not good. And, and being transparent, I have to sometimes just pray for strength. Amen. God, I need mm. your strength. I don't need regular strength. Because my strength ain't working. I need, I need your covering. I need you, God, to come into my house, my mind, my heart, my soul. I need you to come into me on a deeper level so that I can be there for your people. So I can be there not just for your people, but for my family. Amen. Yeah. You know, that's, that's powerful. And I, th I think uh, as I've personally gone through this pandemic, uh, battling those moments of the fear and the anxiety, around a number of issues. I don't do well just sitting all day. I like to move. I need to move. And so finding ways to get out of the house, go for a walk, finding ways to take my two-year-old son outside, burn off some of his energy, burn off some of my energy. But I, I think the biggest key is what you just said, and that is, is praying to my Heavenly Father and saying, Jesus, thank you that you've made a way for me to have access to the Father. Father, would you, the spirit that you've sealed me with, I need, I need him. Today, I can't rely on my own strength because of my own strength. I try to control the situation as best as I think it needs to be controlled. So we've, we've touched on a lot of things in this conversation. And as we bring this conversation to a close, I, I'm wondering, we, we've, we've looked at how uh, those who are struggling during this time, we've given some, some simple practical steps that we could, honestly, the three of us, we could probably elaborate on for hours at this time. Uh, so we'll, we'll have some, at the end of this conversation, we'll have some points of contact if, if you're interested in, in going uh, deeper in some of these areas that uh, Pastor Reggie or Pastor Bob has spoken about. But, but let's, let's land on this. What, when it comes to healthy relationships, it's one of the things that I think is just most key and critical right now in this pandemic, and, and especially this issue of addiction, of struggle, of abuse, <laughs> all of that wrapped into one. And I'm wondering how can we, how can we actually be that light that Jesus has called us to be in our homes with our family members, some of whom have their own addictions, some of whom have their own struggles, we have our own struggles. How can we be the, the, the example of a godly relationship where we're being transparent with our emotions, our struggles, we're finding ways to stay healthy, but then we're being an encouragement to those in our own homes, but also to those in our own churches, in our own communities, through avenues like Zoom, through avenues like FaceTime, through avenues just like an email or a text message. What are, what are a couple simple practical ways that we can encourage those who we know are struggling? You know, one of the things that we do is right now we have Zoom meetings three times a week for people to come together and get support. We also have established a resource list so that we can help people get food, get clothing, get what they need in terms of the necessities to, to just make it through. We also have support numbers that we can direct people to as well. We also, what we began to do is establish a prayer line. We have a prayer line where we do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 6.30 in the morning, and we do it twice a week at 12 p.m. for people that need prayer. We call it the uh, noon power of prayer so that people can just get prayer and get in the environment and talk about 
uh, what's going on with them just to reassure them and let them know that they're not alone. I think one of the biggest things that we can do in all of this is let people know, first of all, that Christ loves them. Um, second of all, we need to be an example showing them the love of Christ. The Bible says, what good is it to have a light and put it under a body? We need to put the light up so others can see, so that we can attract them to how we live, how we walk, how we pray, how we act. That way, we're being an example. You know what I mean? So when we become the example of it, that's why I told you my struggle is real. I have to still be an example for all the people that I'm in contact with, all the people I mentor, all the people that are at the church, all the people I'm connected with committees with. I have to still be a power of example because I'm in touch with this, that the devil wants to seek, kill, and destroy. And if he can destroy me, not that I'm that big guy, but if he can destroy me, it will give people a platform to say, see, I told you it didn't work. And, and, and what I don't want to do is disappoint, disappoint God in what I'm doing. So I pray, like you said, God, just cover, cover me and, and let me be an example. Let my, let, my, let my body be a living sacrifice. Romans 12, a holy sacrifice, living so that I can do what you call me to do, God. Let it be a testament to others. My testimony should be able to help somebody be free. And I think we should not be fearful of what others might think. I think my job is not to worry about what others might think about me. I think my job is to make my testimony my healing place so that people can see. The Bible says in Revelations, you will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by your testimony. My testimony is going to help others become free because they're going to believe that if it can happen for me, it can happen for them too. So I don't want to diminish the fact that, that I had to get help myself. And I also think that when people know we are there for them, that we're not just saying, hey, we're praying for you or we care about you. But when they're in their crisis or they just want to have a conversation, they know that we're there. I, I remember one time I didn't feel like uh, or I wondered if I was really a help to someone. And uh, I remember a bunch of guys said, you know, the fact that you show up gives us hope. So we may not know everything mm -hmm. about addiction or someone's addiction. But what's true is our presence, our love for them gives a lot of hope. Amen. Amen. Well, Amen. guys, this has been an amazing conversation that in a lot of ways I feel like is just, it's just getting started right now. Mm -hmm. but, but to keep things to our time frame, for those of you tuning into this segment this evening, I, I want to leave you guys with a couple of points of contact. And that is for Pastor Bob and for Pastor Reggie. So please, if, you, if you're watching this and you're struggling with, with, with something, uh, or if you have a family member or friends who are struggling with something, please, 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 as Pastor Bob has said repeatedly in this conversation, we are here for you, we are with you, we are for you, and most importantly, Jesus Christ is with you and he is for you. So you can contact Pastor Bob at counseling at genesisyork.com. Or you can reach out to Pastor Reggie at R. How York, just as it sounds, R. How York at gmail.com. And we'll have those uh, on, on the screen or in the comment section available for you for those who, who didn't catch that. So as we close things out here, Pastor Reggie, can I ask you to close us out in a word of prayer for all the people who have tuned in and who, who have been touched by, by this segment this evening? Amen. If I could just read one thing real quickly. Romans 5 says this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace, in which we stand and rejoice in hope, like Pastor Bob said, of the glory of God. And only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, mm. perseverance, character, character, hope, and hope does not disappoint. Amen. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the hope that you gave us that no matter what we go through, it's nothing like the salvation that you offered us by hanging on the cross. Father, we thank you that the tribulations that we're going through will only make us stronger. We thank you, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ for having us here today and bringing a small word to the people that may need some hope, that may need to see character in action. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you keep us protected from any hurt, harm, or danger of any kind and that no pestilence will come by us. And we thank you, God, for giving us this platform to talk about you and to give you the glory and the honor that you do. Father, thank you for the union that you've created between these two churches, because it couldn't have happened any other way except for your, by, by your divine grace and your divine hand. 
Father, touch each and every one of us listening to this tonight. And we pray that you've gotten something out of it, God, that will force you or convict you to change your ways, turn from your ways, and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, gentlemen, Amen. thank you for your time. Really appreciate this. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>